Great. I think, we're, I think we're close, close. People are still logging on, um, but I'm thrilled to um, have you here and we hope to see you Wednesday um, at our lunch about the thread collectors and on Sunday for our film. And I am pleased to introduce the chair of our one book, one community book read committee and all of our fiction <laughs> book reads <Yeah>. actually. Um, <laughs> I'm pleased to introduce Miss Lisa Leish, who will be um, conducting our um, program this morning with Samantha about this incredible book that I can't wait for you to hear all about. Um, and following um, the, the conversation, we'll be open to Q&A. We're going to alternate um, questions in the room, of which we have a bunch of participants here at the JCC. And anyone who's on Zoom, feel free to put any and all questions in the chat, um, or we'll call on you if you want to unmute and speak during the Q&A. Lisa, I'm turning it over to you. Hey, well, hello. Thanks so much, Randy. Um, it's so nice to be here with everybody. I'm very excited this morning to introduce Samantha, uh, Samantha Green Woodruff. Um, Samantha has a BA in history from Wesleyan University and an MBA um, from the NYU Stern School of Business. Uh, she spent most of her career telling stories to executives at MTV Networks as the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Business Development, and subsequently as audience research for the Nickelodeon Kids and Family Group. After leaving her corporate life, she pursued her varied passions, teaching yoga, cooking, and then taking classes at the Writing Institute of Sarah Lawrence College. It was there that she combined her multifaceted background with her wild imagination and passion for history, reading, and writing. Lobata Swipe is her first novel, and I'm so glad she wrote it. It's um, She's also working on her next historical fiction book. Samantha lives in Southern Connecticut with her husband, two children, and two dogs. Thank you so much for being with us today. And Samantha, if you could just sort of uh, start us off by going into a little bit of details of your book um, and giving us an overview of the story for those of us who have not had a chance to uh, read this wonderful book. Sure. Um... So the lobotomist's wife, you wanted me to give you a little, a quick summary. And what else, what was the other one? What, yeah, what else? A quick a, summary. And I, and I think you also have had some pictures or some things to show. I so do, if you yes, want to do that I, and then we can um, go into I, I can, questions, yes, be great. I can go into that as well. Um, so the lobotomist's wife, for those of you who have not read it, is historical fiction. It is a story of, um, it's really a story of two women whose lives intersect around their relationship to the man who invented the ice pick lobotomy and who popularized lobotomy in the United States. It takes place between the 1930s and the mid 1950s. And um, the story is very much an interweaving of fact and fiction. The lobotomist himself, the doctor, who in my book is named Robert Friedman, is based very, I'm sorry, Robert Apter, is based very closely <laughs> on Walter Freeman junior who was the man who pioneered lobotomy in the u.s um however his wife is a complete work of fiction and um the the if we want to get a little deeper because we will be talking about the book so even for those of you who haven't read it so um the lobotomist's wife is a wealthy heiress who has her own interests in the mental health field and works as the administrator running a mental hospital that her father has endowed and um, she ends up meeting and marrying the lobotomist sort of late in life for that era. She's in her 30s. And the second, uh, B, the B character, the secondary um, protagonist is a woman named Margaret Baxter, who is a 1950s housewife who seemingly has everything and suffers from postpartum depression before that was a real diagnosis. And she becomes a patient of the lobotomist's when lobotomy is seen as a real viable answer for something like postpartum depression. Um, so the second part of the book becomes a bit of a thriller of a will she or won't she get lobotomized yeah. and I won't tell you what happens. <laughs> 
Yeah, we won't tell. Don't, don't don't give it away. I mean, it was it was so it was such an interesting topic, and um, I was just wondering, like, what sparked your interest in this particular topic? Sure. Um, so it is a very odd topic for someone to decide they want to write their first book about, I think, particularly given yeah. my background. And you guys got a little bit of my background. So it's not that I was a psych psychotherapist beforehand or that I studied psychology or neurology or neuroscience. I have an MBA and before that I was a history major and I've kind of always been artsy, but also businessy. Um, and mm -hmm. I love to read and I love to read historical fiction. And I have two kids who, when I started working on this book, were, very, were, much, were very young. Now they're getting into their teen years. I have a son who is 11 and a half, or almost 12, and a daughter who will be 14 in a matter of weeks. And um, I spend a lot of time in the car and always have. And so I try to listen to nonfiction books on audio when I'm driving, because I love to curl up and read fictional books. And several years ago, when I had just started writing for fun and was working on a novel that wasn't going to go anywhere about a woman who had given up her career to live in the suburbs and had a seemingly perfect life but wasn't happy and started acting out and it was a contemporary novel kind of very um very inspired by my own life i yeah. um, i was listening to this nonfiction book called get well soon history's worst plagues and the heroes who fought them by a woman named jennifer wright and she's fabulous. She just had a new book come out actually um, about the first female abortionist. She she's a, she writes with a bit with a feminist slant, and um, she's very progressive in her thinking, and she's very funny. And so this book was mostly about things like leprosy and Black Death and like really big plagues, but she had a chapter about lobotomy. <laughs> And um, first of all, the fact that I was listening to this book to begin with is bizarre, but it was kind of fed to me in my algorithm. And it had great Very lovely. uplifting, uplifting topic. Yeah, it sounds exactly. like. <laughs> and this was pre pandemic. So it was sort of a prescient book. She ended with HIV and AIDS. And that was like what she was building to. And then, you know, just a couple of years later, the pandemic hit. And so there would have been a whole other she could have she could have a whole new chapter. Um, yeah, so but anyway, so I'm listening to this book and she talks, she starts talking about lobotomy. And I thought I knew what lobotomy was because of one flew over the cuckoo's nest, basically. And I yeah. knew sort of that Rosemary Kennedy, you know, Joe Kennedy's daughter had been lobotomized or I'd sort of heard that. And so I, I had a sense that it was a 20th century phenomenon, but I didn't really process that the heyday of lobotomy was between the late 30s and the early 50s. And that seemed so contemporary to me and for something that seemed like such a medieval procedure. And right. so I just had this spark of an idea, you know, what if my dissatisfied housewife in my novel was a dissatisfied housewife in a time in this tiny window, this 20 year period when lobotomy was really seen as a viable answer. And, you know, I think many authors, fictional authors will tell you that the seed of a, of a novel comes from yeah. some sort of what if, and that was my what if. Um, and so from there, then I had to become an expert on lobotomy and I did tons of reading and I really, you know, I kind of, I said, this is the book I really want to write. And then I set aside a whole bunch of time to do research and learned as much as I could. And then I went ahead and constructed the story. And from there, I came to the place where I said, you know what? the dissatisfied housewife really isn't the protagonist it's it, it it became a more interesting story for me to tell as i started to invent this wife who started out believing in lobotomy and then comes to understand that it's not quite the miracle cure she thought it was going to be so yeah so interesting you know you mentioned that um robert was modeled after um, the real founder of lobotomy, yeah. dr freeman and so how did it rise to how did he rise to such prominence and even after he sort of goes off the rails, what about all the other doctors that he trained? I mean, at what point did reason start to take over regarding lobotomies and that they were not actually the 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 miracle that Dr. Freeman would have professed that it was? They yeah, were. so um, so I think that I really I really wanted to try and tackle this, the the reasons and the way in which something that now seems so obviously. Yeah. Um, 
flawed. <laughs> that's, a, that's a soft <laughs> word, but um, yeah. so barbaric and so wrong in so many ways that it could have come come to be seen for this brief moment in time as a miracle cure. And I think actually this is a great place if you don't if, if you want for me to start showing some pictures. Um, yeah, that would be great. Okay. So yeah, I cool. I think I can just share my screen. Let me see. Share screen. Share. Am I sharing? Yes, you guys can see it, right? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So then I'm going to go to full screen. Whoops. No slideshow. Where's the little icon to make it a slideshow? Here we go. Okay. So um, so here's a picture of Walter Freeman Jr. The second who was the pioneer of, of lobotomy in the US and and I um, this book that you can see on the left, The Lobotomist, can you, oh, you guys can't see it either because I have your pictures there. There we go. Um, the Lobotomist by a man named Jack L. High, which was Freeman's biography, was my Bible as I was really starting to write Freeman's character and flesh it out. It's an incredible biography and you, I have to love social media because when my book came out, Jack L. High actually reached out to me and then I sent him a copy and he sent me a copy of his and he enjoyed my book which made me feel really good because I then I didn't bastardize what he had done which was awesome so anyway I really did take a lot of notes and cues from from um the bi from Freeman's biography um okay let's see so here we go the facts so freeman like my robert after was a neurologist and a psychologist psychiatrist but he was not a surgeon and um he was very interested throughout his career in finding his breakthrough in medicine he really wanted to make a name for himself in medicine and he was working in mental health all along it was not called mental health at that point it was called psychiatry or treating the insane um, but what I have here are some pictures of, I'm trying to see if I can move this bar so you can see, uh, you can sort of see the pictures where my cursor is on the upper left, uh, on the we upper can right. See it. Samantha, we can see it. The women in the boxes, the people in the boxes. These are some of the treatments and then the women in the, um, the bathtubs closed in, locked in on the bottom. These were the ways that they treated the mentally ill at the time that Freeman was developing lobotomy. And so the reality is that if you were particularly sentenced to um, to be in a state facility, the conditions were beyond grim. If you were violent in any way or extreme, you were likely to be chained up. You might sit in your own excrement for days. You were th th these were more um, th you were there was obviously the straitjackets. And then there were these cutting edge treatments like hydrotherapy, which is these baths that would either be extremely hot or extremely cold, or these sweat boxes that they would put you in for hours on end, hoping to break the psychotic episodes. So free, first, and, and it was very expensive to, you know, in the, the same way that people talk about the prison system being a drain now, the state hospitals were a huge drain in that era. And for Freeman, his goal was to find a way to alleviate the burden of the state. And he really believed make life better for those who were extremely mentally ill. So lobotomy, when he first pioneered it, and when he, you know, he believed early on, and in some ways he was very, very progressive, that there was a neurological connection, that there was something going on in the brain that was causing extreme mental illness, extreme psychosis. And if you think about it, that's a pretty progressive approach relative to the times. Um, but his, his, he hadn't quite pinpointed where in the brain it was or how it worked. And once he figured out that you could sever some of the connections in the frontal lobe and essentially render someone docile and placid and easy to control, you could oftentimes people who would have been sentenced to a life in a state asylum would be able to go home and be with their families. And so for him, that was a huge success. Forget the fact that those people might not be able to 
go to the bathroom by themselves. They might not be able to read or write anymore, even if they could before. They might become fascinated with food and grow morbidly obese. There were a lot of very negative side effects to lobotomy that were that were evident very early on, but relative to spending life chained up in a state institution, he still thought it was a good thing. And at that time, the medical community did as well. Um, let me see if my next slide keeps going here or if, because otherwise I'll tell you a little bit. Yes. Okay. So a little timeline of lobotomy, which will also help you understand. And, and we can talk a little bit about then how the ego took over and where the medical community went. So this is a picture, close your eyes if you're squeamish, of Walter Freeman performing what he ultimately pioneered, which was the ice pick lobotomy. So the initial lobotomy was the was a surgical lobotomy that went in through the top of the skull, that went in through the brain. That was the classic lobotomy. And that was actually developed in um, Portugal by a doctor named Igas Moniz, who won the Nobel Prize for his lobotomy in 1949, I believe, Freeman, who was his protege, nominated him. Um, Moniz did it a little bit differently than Freeman, and Freeman took what Moniz was doing in 1936 and said, I, he's onto something, I'm going to adapt it in my own way, and I'm going to do it and call it lobotomy instead of leucotomy, which is details that are probably that, that aren't necessary to get into, but he wanted it to be clear that he was attacking the frontal lobe. He was not a surgeon, so he had to find a neurosurgical partner who was willing to do this with him, which he did, and a man named James Watts. So from 36 to about 40 to 46, they did lobotomy surgically, Watts and Freeman together. And Freeman was this natural born showman. He would he was a professor at George Washington. My book takes place in New York. I fictionalized the location. Mine's sort of based on NYU and um, Bellevue, but not really. It's all kind of, you know, just a, just a general sense that was my inspiration. He was at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in DC and taught at um, Georgetown or George Washington. Now I'm blanking. Um, but he was a professor. He would do lobotomies in front of a room full of students. And, um, so, so here you've got this 10 years where he's pioneered lobotomy, they're doing them surgically. It's still a huge tax on their resources because it's a surgical procedure. So it requires hospital staff and a hospital stay. And he decided there had to be a way that lobotomy could be done more quickly. It was really, the way he saw it, it wasn't a big deal. You were just going into the front of the brain, disconnecting a few things, and it should be easy. So there was a, a doctor in Italy who had performed some other kind of brain surgery by going through the orbital lobe, the eye socket. And Freeman said, I think we can do this for lobotomy. And that was when he developed what was what is really called the transorbital lobotomy, but was called colloquially the ice pick lobotomy, because he basically took a tool that looked like an ice pick, flipped up your eyelid and hammered it up in there, jiggled it around and pulled it out. And he was such a showman that he used to do that. He there's they some say he was ambidextrous. It's unclear whether he was or not, but he used to take two mallets and do it with both hands at the same time in both eyes in front of auditoriums full of people. Um, now, just to take a step back for a second, just another fact versus fiction, Rosemary Kennedy was in fact lobotomized by Walter Freeman and James Watts, and it was a failed lobotomy. That was before the eye socket version, before the ice pick version, that was the traditional surgical version. Um, and it, But he, like every failure, and this is sort of how he took a left turn, whenever lobotomy didn't go well, that was the exception to the rule. And in, he, he, he never enabled, allowed himself to see the possibility that he wasn't actually doing more good than harm, the harm than good. He thought he was doing more good than harm. So once he developed this ice pick te technique, and that was in 46, he, and the reason he did this was to make it scalable. I'll put that in my business language. Um, in, instead of being yeah. able to perform, let's say, a lobotomy or two a day, he could perform 15 or 20. And he could do them in 10 minutes. He turned them into an outpatient office procedure, 
he stopped using his surgical partner and he did them himself. And he traveled around the country teaching doctors who were not necessarily neurologists and certainly not surgeons how to perform them as well. And that's when things got really crazy. And that was basically between 46 and into the early 50s. Um, and so, Lisa, to answer your second question of, you know, how did this get how, how did it get so popular? Oh, this is this is good, but maybe we won't do this yet. Um, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to go through these because this will give you a sense of yeah. what Freeman, how Freeman justified what he was doing and what he saw as as the good of lobotomy. So the, these are a series of Freeman's pictures. He was a fastidious documenter of his work. So he took before and after pictures often. Um, if you've read my book, there's a moment where he's stops and takes a picture in the middle that is based on a real anecdote that was like a moment when he and James Watts apparently started to really part ways because Watts came in and he had paused his lobotomy so he could take a picture um instead of finishing the procedure he was more interested in the picture so here if we just look at these and I'm going to read them out loud I don't know if everyone especially if there's people I know in an auditorium um, the top says age has little weight in the choice of suffering patient. The candidate may be eight years old or 80. Better social results are obtained in aged patients. Okay, fine. And then the bottom, it says schizophrenic boy who had to be caged in a basement because of his violent behavior before lobotomy and a year after lobotomy, no longer dangerous. Okay, so that's his spin on the, on why it was so good. Here's another one. This is so painful to read this this caption in some instances, the best that can be done for family is to return the patient to them in an innocuous state, a veritable household pet. Wow. Okay, and he says a simple schizophrenic patient makes makes a nice household pet after operation before looking he like this and after looking wonderful. And then here's one more restrained for two years because of extreme violence and then smiling and happy the next day. The last one, this is this one kills me too. Entranced by voices, this lady came down to earth following lobotomy and went back to keeping house. So these were the ways that he rationalized and justified what he was doing. And in the beginning, I think a lot of the medical, a lot of the medical community saw more good than harm. However, with the with the introduction of Thorazine and chemical pills, like you know, pharmacological ways to treat the same things that were not permanent and were not surgical, lobotomy started to fall out of favor. And that happened in the mid 50s as the drugs were beginning to gain more popularity and gain more um, more mass usage. But Freeman at that point, I think, was so deeply entrenched in his own beliefs that he was unable to ever really for his life see that lobotomy might not have been the best answer and he himself ended up performing lobotomies let me just see where i go with my presentation oh well the lobotomobile is a little aside um he continued to perform lobotomies until 1968 he moved to california and he did oh. them sort of it, they were much less popular, but he still had patients, and he finally lost his medical license in 1968 when he performed a third lobotomy on someone who had had two failed ones from him, and she had a cerebral hemorrhage and died. Um, and he often would say, if the lobotomy didn't work, it wasn't because lobotomy wasn't the right answer, it was because he hadn't gone deep enough or cut the right things, and he would go back in. Um, there is, if you've ever heard of Freeman, they talk about him driving around in what he called his lobotomobile, his camper van. This is a picture of him in his camper van. That's real. But as far as I can, could tell from my research, he did not call it his lobotomobile. It was just the car that he used and he would go camping as well. He was a big outdoorsman. Um, so, okay, so that was my, that's my fact versus fiction. Now I get into the, unlike the, the ways in which Robert, what I fictionalized. I don't know if you wanna go there now, or if you wanna um, move on to other questions you might have, we can do either one, really up to you. Um, you might as well just go through the rest of your presentation okay. and then we can, uh, okay. and then we can answer some more questions. Okay, yeah. so um, so the so I fictionalized a lot of elements of the story in the novel. First of all, as I've already mentioned, I had my lobotomist marry an American heiress, 
um, a, fic, a, the woman, a woman named Ruth Emeraldine, who became his greatest advocate. Um, Freeman had uh, his relationship with his wife was very different than the relationship I created between Ruth and Robert. And uh, um, so he had a very strong Robert had a very strong marriage in my in my novel. They had no children. As I said, I said I moved the setting from uh, Washington, D.C. to New York. And as I said, oh, and then I'm going to skip that one because it, it might be a spoiler. Now, the real lobotomist's wife and the reason that I invented a wife is because Freeman's wife, Marjorie Lorne Franklin Freeman, was um, she wasn't who I envisioned to be married to someone like the lobotomist. She was a strong woman and she actually and she was very bright. She taught economics, had she had a Ph.D. in economics and taught for a while um, until she was let go because of her Catholicism. Um, she and Freeman had four children and one of their children, their youngest son, was lost to them in a really tragic accident in um, Freeman, as I said, was a was a really avid outdoorsman. And he was on a hiking trip with their 11 year old and the son sort of walked over to the edge of a of a body of water, a stream or something that went into a waterfall and fell in and died. Um, and actually, I, I, I think it was like a waterfall fast running water because I know someone did go in and try and save him and died as well. Um, and that moment, which happened to be 1946, which was the moment when Freeman developed his ice pick lobotomy, was a real inflection point in their marriage. From what I understand, Marjorie became um, an alcoholic and was really kind of lost to the family in a lot of ways. As was Freeman, he was obsessed. He, if he had been obsessed with his work before, he doubled down on work and just that was it. So they had a they had a very old fashioned marriage. They stayed married till the end of of her life. She died before he did, but he was a philanderer. He had lots of affairs. They didn't have much of a marriage that was, a, you know, a modern version of what marriage would be. And that wasn't my vision. I I felt that the wife of someone who was doing something like this, I wanted her to be the eyes and ears through which we experience lobotomy as the reader so that we could understand the the transition that one might make from thinking it could have been at one time a miracle cure to all of a sudden realizing maybe it wasn't and think and the the dilemmas that that would pose for you as someone who loved the man who pioneered it was a much more interesting arc to me than than the real life not that the real life isn't also interesting but that wasn't kind of those weren't the themes i was looking to explore i was much more looking to explore women and finding their voices and marginalized people trying to fit in and what that meant and the things that we do to make ourselves feel better and feel good and and all of those themes. So um, so that's kind of the end of my presentation. The last page just says what I just said. So I can I can stop sharing and then we can oh not new share stop share. And now we can go back um, to questions and talking and whatever. Yeah. Well, it was interesting because you talked about Ruth because obviously Ruth is the is the protagonist. She is the lobotomist's yes. wife, and um, you know, and as you said, she really was a pioneer in her career wise. I mean, she rises to the highest level, you know, through her compassion and relationship building, which is how a lot of women tend to. Those are usually the strengths that they have. But then she gets blindsided by both her husband and that superintendent, the assistant superintendent, largely because she trusts them. Um, with areas that she doesn't consider to be her strength. So do you think that women still fall into that sort of similar situation or do you think that we've advanced from there? Right. And and so that's one question. And then what was your sort of goal in writing Ruth? So I think that in some ways, yes, we've advanced and in some ways we haven't. I mean, I think that there's still plenty of examples of um, areas where women tend to defer to men. I mean, you look, you know, you look at the um, the push towards women in STEM these days, and women. You know, my daughter, who is going to be fourteen, is really good at math and really good at science. But the boys in her math class, the boys who are good at math, are still two levels of math ahead of her at school. There, there is, there are still those areas where it feels like there was a natural inequity 
And I think it's still a struggle for women to say, no, I'm not going to accept that and I'm going to push through it. Um, and I, so, and for Ruth, she was human. I mean, she was in so many ways, she was a trailblazer, but the, it, it was impossible. I think, I think it is impossible for any human being to be perfect on all fronts. And that was one of my real goals of the book too, is to explore this idea that none of us are perfect and that that's okay. You know, we're going to make mistakes. Ruth made some pretty big mistakes for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, so, so yes. So I was trying to write a flawed and human protagonist who we could relate to, who was an empathetic person and to whom we could, you know, also feel empathy. And, um, and at the same time, give the reader a view of how and why you, one might become devote, so devoted to a cause that they become blind to certain things. And I think that's what happened societally with lobotomy for that little period of time. Um, yeah. You know, and then to explore yeah, the interest of a marriage, right? The, how, yeah, how, well, I mean, it was just, it was a fascinating thing how she sort of supports him, but then she ultimately recognizes that it's not, like she kind of comes to realize that what, what's happening is not, not okay, right? Yeah. She sort of blindly trusts that everything he's saying is good. And then, I mean, I think there's so many people that realize that whether it's, you know, doing rogue lobotomies or even financial situations that a lot of times we, you know, we defer to, to the male partner and then realize later uh, that maybe it's not right what's happening. So, right. right. That's yes. Interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about Margaret's character. So, you said she's sort of the B character, um, and she suffers from postpartum depression and is led to believe that lobotomy is the, the uh, cure. Can you talk about her character and how you, um, what you discovered about the development and understanding of, of that condition at that time and how things have changed from then? Sure. So, um, I as I said, when I first came up with this idea, Margaret was the protagonist. And I started to write the book that way, actually. And then as I developed Ruth, the early drafts were one chapter Ruth, one chapter Margaret, all the way through. Um, and you know, the, the writing process is such that you, you start to come to see who is more interesting on the page. And while I actually related to Margaret more than I did Ruth, um, Ruth took more time and effort to really round. Um, Margaret was, you didn't, it felt for me that you didn't want to read about the feeling of postpartum depression for an entire novel. It got really de depressing, frankly. Um, yeah. I did not suffer from postpartum depression, but I did suffer from, I think, a, lev a level of postpartum anxiety. And um, so I, what I did to kind of flesh Margaret's character was I found some articles, I, I read what I could from the era, and I found one fascinating article in Better Homes and Gardens in the early 50s that talks about the baby blues. They had called named baby blues by then, but the solution was like, get a little sleep, uh, you know, get sleep for a few days and some fresh air and, and you'll be fine again. And um, so I, what then I went to contemporary writing to really get into the mindset. So I read some memoirs and uh, there, there's so much, you know, writing now about postpartum depression. And I wanted to, to try and really capture for the reader what it felt like to be in someone's head in that state where there's so much should, it should be perfect and I should feel this and I should feel that and I should want this and I can't do any of it. Um, and for me, developing that was that was one of the most interesting pieces to explore because I think that was is the closest parallel to so much of what goes on in our world today, particularly still for women. And when I was writing this novel, um, the Harvey Weinstein and Me Too stuff was just really bubbling up. And I felt in my mind, yeah. the novel was very topical to that because it is about this idea of women not feeling like they have their voices. And even as you talk about Ruth, trusting men and deferring in areas where we really shouldn't. And so much of it is insidious and it's, and it's almost impossible to pinpoint. It's not as obvious as Harvey Weinstein. Um, and so for Margaret, when I started writing her story, I was going to have it be her husband who wanted her to get the lobotomy. But in the end, I found it was much more powerful and more in keeping with 
the way that I was thinking about the time and again, the themes I was trying to touch that it's she who wants to make herself better because I think that we are such a world today of quick fixes and need to be perfect. And I mean, you know, the latest is Ozempic, right? Like, and no, no judgment. In fact, my husband is on it, but it is, you know, it, all of a sudden there's a miracle drug that you can shoot yourself up with and lose weight. Yeah. Like now, now we have a quick fix. Now we don't have to do all the other things and they don't always work. And maybe if you do all the other things and they don't work, you could just be okay with your body as it is. But that, that idea, and there's a million examples of it in, in current, in modern society, um, was really important to me. This, you know, that, that, that theme of maybe it's okay to not be perfect and just sit with things as they are and be who you are. And so I wanted that tension to come from Margaret as opposed to be imposed upon her by her husband. And I think that was like subtly, but some, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, but it seemed like on some level, like in the beginning, it seemed like Robert was trying to help her through talk therapy, but then he ultimately can't stop himself from suggesting the lobotomy. So I was wondering if that was always his intention. Was it sort of like a, a, a slow burn to get her to that? Or was that kind of what you were thinking or when you were writing that area? That yes, section. I think that because he was also a psychiatrist and he was then practicing in this, you know, uh, suburban practice, at least part of the time, that he would try and use talk therapy a little bit where he could, but he didn't really believe in talk therapy. So I think that yeah. what, what Robert would have done is if Margaret wasn't going to be a lobotomy candidate, he would have terminated with her and said, I can't help you. But, yeah. but he wa but he, saw so many as lobotomy candidates that weren't necessarily I mean and that is based on Freeman as well I mean I don't I, one of the more contemporary famous lobotomy stories is this man named Howard Dully who if you google lobotomy his stuff will come up he was lobotomized I think in the late 50s early 60s but he was a kid and he was like a un, he he was his mom passed away or his parents were divorced and his he was really disobedient and acting out and his stepmother had him lobotomized and his was a successful lobotomy like he went on to be a functioning member of society he was a bus driver but he and and he wrote a memoir and forgive me if i'm butchering it because i read i read his his um his stuff a long time ago now um, but yeah. that, 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 that's the, the, the gestalt of it, like the, whether the exact is right or not, that that's the basic idea. Um, okay. so Freeman really believed lobotomy could fix everything at a certain point. And it, yeah. it's a little scary to think about, but it was the case. Yeah. What was the thing that most, as you were researching that most angered you and most surprised you? Hmm, that's interesting. I think the thing that most surprised me was the benchmarks that were used to to consider something successful. I mean, even Igas, Moniz, even the first leucotomies that there was that the first study that was done of 20 people, I think it was half, if that, that were truly successful, like that truly, you know, either either their state was maybe 70% were either the same or better and 30% might've been worse and that was considered success. And so that idea, if you think about what our benchmarks are now in medicine for yeah. something to be successful, like imagine that. And, that, and then I, did, I found a study um, from the, a hospital in Trenton in the early 50s. Like when I, the, the data that I used in, um, when Ruth has her, Mandrake, do, not Mandrake, he's the, what, um, oh, Rosemary, oh, I said someone is saying something about Rosemary Kennedy. The data that I used when Ruth does her study finally was loosely taken from a study I found that a hospital in Trenton had done about their own lobotomies. And again, it was like, so many were not improved. And if it was just baseline, the same or slightly better, that was considered great. And that to me was the most surprising. Um, angering, God, that's a tricky one. I mean, I think that 
the thing the thing that made me th that is the most infuriating about it is free is really is is the hubris of it is is this i is the the fact that and I, I don't think i said this before when freeman lost his license he spent the rest of his life and it was only a few years he died of cancer traveling the country visiting his patients because he really thinking that they were they, they sent him christmas cards every year he he thought he had saved their lives and so that god complex that he had this idea that he couldn't see the the downside of what he had done it, it I don't, I mean, it was aggravating and also just astonishing, yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there I felt was the same question. way. I was like, I yes. Yeah, I can't see the questions. So I'm going to open it up and make sure that we get everyone's questions. I see if one. They type it in the you, chat. Awesome. You said Rosemary Kennedy had a failed lobotomy. Were there any consequences to that, considering she was a famous person? So, there were no consequences because Joe Kennedy, um, he had Rosemary lobotomized without even telling his wife. And um, the Kennedy, rest of the Kennedy family did not find out until he passed, I think, in the 80s. She was in an assisted living facility for the rest of her life. She was reduced basically to um, like uh, the mental state of a three year old. And, um, but nobody knew about it. It was totally undercover. So that was part of it. The other part, I would say, I think there's three parts. So part one was people didn't know. Part two was those who did know, um, just described it to the, oh, that was a failed one, but the benchmarks were different. So some of them failed. That was part two. And um, part three was that, yes, as lobotomy continued, the medical community, big chunks of it, believed that it was not the right solution, but there wasn't another solution yet. So there was this period of time where there were people who were not in support of lobotomy, but they, but not, there wasn't necessarily a good second option. And so that was like this tricky time where still, they, there were still many hospitals and places that would not perform lobotomy. Um, and another one of the big reasons that they didn't was because they believed that it was like against God and humanity because you're changing someone's personality, which is like what's God given was the way that they saw it. Um, but even but even those who just looked at it from a strictly medical perspective didn't some there were detractors, but there weren't enough yeah. detractors to stop it from happening altogether. So there were hospitals that didn't do it, but there were lots who did. And I think I didn't mention this either. One of the reasons that Freeman wanted so desperately to scale lobotomy and move to the ice pick version was that after World War II, there were so many soldiers coming back with mental illness, with shell shock, that he actually was working with the VA and lobotomizing tons of soldiers to help ameliorate their, their woes. And there was such a volume of need for that that um that you know it, it it was this idea that making people better was more important than what ac what it actually meant who they were when they were better so it, it it's it's pretty scary to think about interesting um i'm wondering i'm i don't know if you're familiar but in the in los angeles i grew up in los angeles and my my younger sister had some learning challenges and she used to go to the kennedy center which was started by the Kennedys. And I'm I'm assuming it was because of what happened to Rosemary. Were you familiar at all with that? I'm not uh, sure. That no. area? That, no. no. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Can we um, see whether there are any questions here in the room? Is that okay? We do that yes. now? Okay. So Absolutely. Here, any questions? Please put them in. Here it, okay. Here in the room, we have our usual challenge. If you're going to ask a very short question, I can repeat it. If you want to make a comment that's more, I need you to come up. Otherwise, the people will not hear you uh, on the uh, uh, you know, internet. So um, we'll have to do the way we normally do it. Is there somebody who would like to get started with a question or comment? Any questions or comments? Have everyone's been lobotomized in there? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm still absorbing. This is like 
<laughs> stunning and horrifying and super interesting. It's, it's it's horrifying, horrifying when you read it. It's so horrifying. I mean, it really is. It was such a good book, but you're you get. I was getting so angry as I was reading the book. Marta um, Gordon just, is coming up, so we have a question for the room. Okay. Any questions? I was well, I'm never... online. Can I ask a question? Once, sure. Um, just type it in the chat if you're online. Well, I, I don't have a computer. I'm actually on the phone. Okay. okay, just wait one second. We have a question from the room and then, it, okay. and then you're up. All right, that's fine. Ms. Marta, go first, please. I am not in favor of lobotomies, but I think now with all these horrible things that are happening, and as people, young people with serious mental health problems, it might not be a bad idea to change the personality. I, you know, it, it, uh, you know, there are not enough mental health people to help these people, but it seems to be young people are doing horrible things, shooting up schools. I, it, it's probably better for them to be, go back to school, we have more psychiatrists and mental health people. But I think in that case, it would not be a bad idea. Probably, they probably would resist it, but. I think that you raise, what, what you're saying is fascinating and very deep because I think that in some ways, everyone in the room and everyone on the Zoom might nod their heads and agree if, if that would be a way to stop the unbelievable number of shootings that we've had in this country in this year. All of a sudden, it seems like a maybe it's not such a bad idea. And I think that's how lobotomy became popular in a moment was it seemed like a solution to a problem. And if that if that would really be the solution to the problem, I don't know, maybe we, you know, maybe we would reconsider. But it turns out that I think it's more complicated than that. And you end up with other problems. And not everyone who was lobotomized was totally um, normal. Well, definitely not normal, but even, uh, you know, some were still violent. So, no, for the most part, they weren't, but it didn't always work. But but your point is well taken that, um, well, I would not advocate for lobotomy in particular. I do think we're, we are definitely in a mental health crisis in this country. And the need for new and better and more comprehensive treatments is absolutely there. No question. I, I did know someone in the 60s that had a lobotomy. And it changed her personality completely, but she could you could deal with her after that, you know. Right. And that sounds like it was a very successful lobotomy. That was the most successful lobotomies were people who were then able to go back to society in some way or other and be more calmer and because it 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 stopped all the impulsive behavior. And so, you know, sometimes maybe it was just enough for people to still function, but other times it went too far. And it was it was all of your cognitive abilities were wiped out. Very okay. interesting subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Myrna. Okay, on the phone. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, more recently, they were using shock therapy uh, because they had discontinued lobotomies, and I guess talk therapy didn't always work. So they were using shock therapy. Do you know anything about? shock therapy and what the situation is with that the pros and cons and are they so still I, doing it i don't know the details i will tell you that um freeman used shock therapy before he used lobotomy and he actually used electroshock as his form of anesthesia when he was doing his 10 minute ice pick procedures um shock therapy is still used and sometimes it two great results from what i understand the the thing about lobotomy that I that I keep coming back to, and I am I will I, I want to say very clearly, I am not a psychiatrist, I am not a neurologist, I am not a medical professional, just a girl who likes to write books and did some research <laughs> and has a crazy <laughs> imagination. But um, from what I have read and what I understand about shock therapy, it can be very helpful and it is not permanent in the same way. Lobotomy is going and, you know, think of it as severing a limb. You're severing connections that cannot be reconnected in the brain. Shock therapy is intended to give a jolt and maybe create a rewire, do, you know, have the neuropathways move in a different direction. And so those are two very different things. Um, right, because it's very often repeated several times. Yes, right. Um, and I don't know what the benefits are, but some people, I guess, gain by it. 
Well, if you think of, I guess if you think of the brain for a second as like a twirly slide that goes around and around, this is a terrible metaphor, but I'm just going to stay with it. Um, the idea of shock therapy is to maybe like take a couple kinks out of that twirly slide. And what lobotomy does is cut the slide in half and separate it. So you can't use it anymore. And um, so that's the, that's the difference, basically. Um, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Did I have a question from Irene who wanted to know who financed the treatment and the medical of yes. the medical procedures. So um, Freeman was very egalitarian. He didn't charge very much money. So people, if people were paying out of pocket, they didn't pay very much. It would be like a hundred dollars maybe, um, which I can't, I'm not good enough at math to tell you what that would be in today's dollars, but it wasn't a crazy amount of money. And um, the, 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 when he did huge projects, like he did in my book, I talk about Operation Ice Pick, where he went and lobotomized like 200 and pl uh, plus people. That was a real trip. And that was the public hospitals in the state. So the state, it was often state financed as he was performing these lobotomies and training other um, doctors. Uh, did lobotomies become popular in other countries? Or are they still wait being one second before we get to that? Sally, can someone unmute Sally for a question from the room? Sally, you're muted. Sally, you're still muted. <laughs> one minute. Thank we're you. Go ahead, Sally. Yes, so I wanted to ask about the procedure called deep brain stimulation, that it's not severing, as I understand it, but somehow stimulating the brain to, and do you know anything about that? I don't, no. That's another, I guess, way of uh, addressing the brain, but not severing, okay. Yes. No, so I, I mean, I think that what what Freeman was on to, as I said earlier, is that there are many, that there there is a lot in the um, biology of the brain that impacts our moods, our behaviors, our emotional state, our mental health, and that, that there's physiological things that impact that. And so there are a variety of things, of treatments that have developed since lobotomy to address those issues. Um, in less possibly barbaric ways. But I don't know about that one in particular. Um, lobotomy in other countries, yes, it was um, it was adopted all, all over the place. It started in Portugal and all over Europe for sure. It was being done in Russia. In fact, there was a, a New York Times headline that I found that I pulled into the novel in the early 50s that the Russians said it was barbaric and they weren't gonna do it anymore. Um, and there are they are now starting to perform lobotomies and i haven't done a read a lot of reading on this but i will tell you they're starting to perform lobotomies again but in a very different and very targeted way so it might be yeah. one tiny neuron it's not this surgery that it's not the same kind of surgery and again it's this idea of with mapping the brain and understanding the biological components of mental health, that there are things that they now believe they can do that will make tiny tweaks in the same way as the taking a serotonin, an SSRI or another drug for depression or anxiety or one of those things. Um, I see hands raised. And well, we have someone in the room, um, but we need you to unmute. And then we'll have Dolores online. Go ahead. Do we have a question from the room or no? Dolores, you ask your question while we're waiting for the, um, the room, please. All kinds of mute issues today. <laughs> I'm going to say one thing. Oh, okay. Good. Um, there are two things I wanted to discuss, but one was in the book when they did the first lobotomies, 
It was a real procedure and there were two doctors who did it. What happened after was this ice pick lobotomy, which they would just go into a room and have, uh, put an ice pick in somebody's head instead of a surgeon. I don't think it was a surgical procedure, but he would go around, he could do like 20, 30 people in a day because he used an ice pick which was really unsanitary as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the second thing I wanted to tell you was I had three children in three years and one month. And then I had a terrible postpartum uh, depression. They didn't know what it was. So the doctor gave me Valium. And it was so much and so long that um, I became addicted to the Valium. So today uh, they're doing different things are better things for postpartum. But again, like this ice pick, as it was early on, it wasn't, I think, the way it should have been done. So um, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Dolores, what's your question? I, I don't know if you can hear me. We can. Yes. You can. I had difficulty tr trying to do this, which I've never done before as far as talking. This way, I might have missed. I might have missed some of your questions and comments. So, what I did want to know, and again, I don't know if you mentioned this, did they just drop the lobotomies completely in that earlier time, or did they do re more research on it to see if they could develop a better way of? doing this? So um, I, I, I didn't really answer this, so I will. They, when Thorazine and the, the original antipsychotic drugs were introduced, the first antipsychotic drugs really, they found that those were so effective at doing the same things that lobotomy was, was, was doing. And let, let's be clear, this is in mental institutions, in state institutions and hospitals. Doctor's offices, I think, was a little bit of a different thing, right? So if people were still believing, I mean, that's how Freeman was able to keep lobotomizing people into the late 60s. But in, in the mass of society and in the big institutions, they moved to drugs because drugs did the same thing and it was easier and it was not as permanent. Um, so that's the short answer. So they didn't they didn't keep going with lobotomy because at that point they said there's too many negative effects and we have something else that works better that doesn't have those negative effects. Um, and just one comment about the ice picks, it was an ice pick originally. So so they say it ultimately it was an actual tool that was developed for lobotomy. But Freeman did not believe in sanitary conditions. He did not believe in as he said germs and all that crap. He just <laughs> went for it. Um, that was true. And that was also pretty shocking to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this was so fascinating. I think um, we are out of time, but I think Randy wanted to just, uh, um, I don't know if you wanted to join in, but I mean, this was so fascinating. We could have talked for hours. So thank you so much for coming and joining thank us. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Samantha. That was fascinating. Um, you're such a good storyteller. And uh, the link to purchase the lobotomist's wife is in the chat and we will be sending it. We sent it with the with today's link and we'll be sending it out tomorrow with our thank you note. Um, we thank everyone in the room for participating and we thank everyone for joining on Zoom. Um, and thank you, Lisa, so much for leading um, a great conversation. With Samantha, we enjoyed it so, so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Time. Thank you, everybody. Nice to meet you. Everyone have a, have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.